you know, and I realized they hadn't even seen it. So, you know, these people, <laughs> they all, they all, they, they, they all uh, blow smoke, but they, they, they haven't even seen the series, most of them. Um, anyway, to cut a long story short, that, that got me into my first movie, which was a movie called Criminal Law with um, uh, Gary Oldman, uh, Kevin Bacon, Joe Don Baker. And we shot that up in uh, Montreal and Quebec. We, we shot the series. And thereafter, I just sort of, that was the, that, that was really my start in, in um, Hollywood, if you will. Okay. So, uh, and from there, you know, I've had some successes and I've had some failures, but you, know, you will always do that in this industry. Um, so really, that's a brief summary of what I've done. Right? Now you people can tell me what you've done. Okay. After years. <laughs> so the best thing is, look, ask me questions if you want, and then we'll go from there. All right? Okay, I have a question. Um, as a director, are you, are you more of a strict type of director? A script? Strict. Strict. Are you more strict with strict. your... Strict. Strict. Like, uh, are you very For hard? <coughs> strict. Oh, strict. Oh, strict. Yeah, with, strict. with your actors, oh, yeah. you give them more freedom. <laughs> Here's the thing, when you're a director, first of all, films cost a lot of money, a lot of money. Uh, second of all, you have a lot of people breathing down your neck. You have producers, uh, if you're working for a studio movie, you have the studio. And it's, they're breathing down your neck because of money, as simple as that. And what happens is, you have scheduled the film to be shot over, let's say, 50 days, right? Um, and the point is, you have to make your days. In other words, if you don't, then they start breathing down your neck. They start saying, get a move on. They start saying, uh, maybe we can cut some stuff. You don't need to, right? And of course, you fight it. You, know, you obviously, uh, you, you, you often do battle with, uh, sometimes with your producer, and certainly with the, um, with the studio. So, a director really controls the whole thing from the from pre-production right through the whole process. Um, obviously, pre-production is all about what a director wants, and everybody on the crew, in their particular jobs, it's their it's their responsibility to get what what you want. I want you know on say page 15 there's a party scene. How many extras you want? Well, I say I want 150, right? And maybe the line producer, he's the practical guy in charge of the money on the floor. They'll say, well, you know, it's a little too much. Can we cut it by 25? Okay, so maybe I cut it by 25, or I say, you know, I want extras on, <clears throat> on the scene further up. There's a riot scene. On the, I'll give you, I'll cut some extras from there to put them in the scene. So, you know, it's a give and take. Um, but really, the strict yes, you have to be. You have to be in total control of the movie. Um, because if you're not, then the movie starts to, um, starts to go over schedule, over budget, right? Um, and, uh, and then you don't work again. <laughs> if it does that. Yes? What do you enjoy the most and the least about your job? Sorry, speak. I can't. What do you enjoy the most and the least about your job? You mean directing? Yes. Uh, editing. What? I don't, I don't like shooting much. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like shooting much. The point about shooting is you're up at four in the morning, right? Oh. You're on the set, you've got everything planned, and things go wrong, and then you work a very hard day. Normally, your days are 10 hours, sometimes 12 hours, right? Now, um, and if you work 12 hours, you get a lunch break, okay? So you start at you don't get a lunch seven, break at 7 in the morning, you finish 7 at night, right? You get your lunch break and that's that. The other way of doing it is working 10 hours straight. So nobody, your lunch is on the run. Everybody work, works right, right, right the way through. It's very broad and, and, and honestly, it's very, it's very tough. You're pushing all the time, you keep on schedule uh, to make sure everything is moving as fast as it can. And by the end of the day, and certainly by the end of the 
by the end of the movie you're exhausted. It's kind of close there. So my, my best time is the, in the editing room afterwards. So I, I can sit there with a cup of coffee and watch ever, everything uh, that I've shot come up on the screen. And, uh, and in editing it, of course, the film just gets better and better. It doesn't get worse. So editing for me, best part. What, what determines whether a series or a movie will be successful, popular and liked by the people? What is the main factor that determines it? Uh, 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 what's the main factor that will make it successful? Yeah, series uh, or a movie. <laughs> well, of course, if we all knew that, we would all be making films and make a ton of money. Um, you know, films are... Um, you don't know, as simple as that. You just don't know. What the, um, the companies that finance movies do, uh, the, way, the way they do it is this, what they do is they have a script and the first thing you do is cast it. So you try and, what they try and do is cast it with some names, right? And you're not going to afford Brad Pitt and people like that, they're going to be way too expensive. But what you do is you get for, um, uh, you get, uh, and what happens is, uh, the buyers will, from the various countries will look at the cast, they'll look at the movie, they'll read the script, and they'll say, let's say it's Germany, we'll give you X amount of dollars for this. We'll guarantee X amount of dollars. Once all the countries have, you know, once you've sold it to a lot of countries, and if it's really good, it's sold to all the countries, you can basically go to the bank and get the money for the cost. So it guarantees your, your, it guarantees your finance. That's what it does. So they take it to Cannes with the cast, with the names. They sell it to all the different territories around the world, or as many as they can. They try and get a U.S. distribution as well. And each country then says, "We will guarantee you X amount." Right. With, let's say you sold the thing to 15 different countries, you could basically then go to the bank right, and say you know, that will guarantee you. Yeah. Right? So what you learn is that if they do it right, 
after the first time. It doesn't matter what they say, don't ever let them do it again if you're happy with that, right? Yeah. So that's two instances of, of uh, injuries. Yeah. Um, what do you say is the biggest challenge in the film management industry? Not what is the most annoying, just what is the biggest challenge? Sorry, I'll tell you. What is the biggest challenge? Yeah. In filmmaking? Yes. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> Everything, every damn thing in filmmaking is a, is a challenge, right? From getting the money to make the film, you know, getting your crew together, they're all independent of the crew. And in fact, Bulgaria has a terrific crew here. You know, independent crew that have obviously worked at Millennium and so forth. But I just finished a movie in Greece and it was a Bulgarian crew. They're, they're, they're world class, they're, they're very, very good. Um, getting them together. Um, shooting is the most pressure, obviously, because time uh, time means money, as simple as that. And just the, the grueling thing of actually um, shooting the movie is the most strenuous time. Afterwards, the most difficult time is when you finish your cut of the movie and you have to, uh, you know, the, the studio or the financiers start sending sending you a lot of stupid notes about how you can actually improve it, right? <laughs> so, so that's that's where uh, that's and they preview the film. So what happens is they invite an audience to come and look at it, right? And they make little scorecards, right? Which scene did you like best? Boom. Which scene was the worst scene? Which actor did you like best? Right? Was and so on and so forth. So so and and you always get points out of 100, they total this thing. At the end they say, uh, how many gave an excellent review? How many gave a very good review, right? How many gave a fair review? And so it goes on. So you go through this process, having done your cut, a director always gets two, um, two, uh, get, gets two, two showings of the film, right? Legally on your contract, right? And then the studio, because the studio has control of it, they can do what they want with it. But hopefully, two, two previews, you're, you're okay. So. Yeah. Are there any projects that you regret working on? Oh, God, yes. <laughs> How about Green Lantern? Jesus. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> but they did pay me a lot of money for it. So. <laughs> No, no, no. Be, you, know, you take your project and you just do the best job you can, about, right? Green Lantern is a case in point studio film where the studio controlled it um, and they dictated a lot of the, you know, a lot of the content and so forth in that movie. And they kept cutting money all the time. It was, can we... Can we cut the budget? Can we cut the budget? Can we cut the budget? On that movie, I storyboarded a whole last third of the movie to a huge ending for the movie, and the studio came in and said, you can't do any of it. We've got to, we can't, we can't afford it. Get it. So that's the sort of crap we have to put up with, you know, with the studio. However, that's one I really <coughs> regretted doing. Um, I, I don't regret any of the others, really. Yeah. Were there any you rejected? Do I? Yeah. Some which you rejected? Any projects which you rejected? Uh, oh, I've rejected? Yeah. You mean, not really, not really. But I, I, when I did Goldeneye, with Piers Brosnan, I was offered every Bond film after that and I turned them all down because I just didn't want to blow up yet another control of them. <laughs> the same thing over and over again. Yeah. But, uh, did I regret it? No, not really. Okay. Yeah. Since your answer to that question was Green Lantern, I just heard yesterday that there was a second movie in the making. How does that work to get? Is that true? That For there what? was a For second Green Lantern, Lantern planned? Oh, I'm sure they'll do another one. I mean, Warner Brothers are going through Oh, it specifically named you in the list. That's why I was confused about that. Did you plan I, that movie? I, did I, you I, want I to make think it? they are going to do another one. They will, but. Yeah, Warner not Brothers is going it. through a terrible time at the moment. None of their movies, The Flash, for example, which came out last week, is a disaster. Really? I heard it's very good. Hmm? I heard it's very good. It is very good. <laughs> 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 they 
heard it's very good, and someone said it is very good. Yeah, but the right. film, yeah, I'm sure it's good. But I'm just saying that for Warner Brothers, the film is going to run at a big loss. For whatever reason, um, the film is going to run at a big loss. And the Marvel movies at the moment are gradually, um, you know, they're gradually getting less and less less and less money. They cost a fortune, those movies. I mean, it's 200, 250 million. You're paying for those movies, right? And sometimes more. And uh, on top of that, it's 100 million for spending on publicity and uh, promoting the movie. So at the end of the day, it's probably the total cost of something like The Flash is close to 400 million, I would say if you include the publicity and the promoting of the movie. And, and you, have to, you have to make three times, so it'll have to make, in order to break even, it will have to make $900 million. That's just to break even. Right. Okay. I hope I can sell that question. Um, if you had to pick one movie that is the only 10 out of 10 movie for you, which one would it be? Like the best movie for you ever? Yes, Lawrence of Arabia. Okay. Oh. Good. Absolutely. How can I follow that up? Something. How would you rate? Since you said huge successes and failures, how would you rate your youth, your best success? And which movie would that be compared to that movie? So, so you could. Both how would you rate your best movie compared to Lawrence of Arabia? And which one would it be? I would say Lawrence of Arabia is ten, and my best movie is three. <laughs> Which one would that be? Hmm? Which, Which one? one would that be? Uh, I, my best movie of Probably Casino Royale was probably my best. I accept that. That's good. Was probably the best. Which one would be the worst? And why is it Green Lantern? <laughs> Undoubtedly Green Lantern. I think. Oh, no, I, did. I, I, I did a film. My second movie was a film called Defenseless, which was, I don't know, it was a six million dollar movie and so at the time. And, uh, and we previewed it, and it scored 25 out of 100. That was probably my worst film. Hmm. And it, it was just not, not, it just wasn't good, as simple as that. You know. Casino Royale is better than three other ten. <laughs> Casino Royale was a lot better than that. <laughs> know exactly what I want when I go in. Um, the method of shooting, you know you have to light each setup. So what you do, um, you know, if I've got, I don't know, let's say 20 shots, for example, for a day, you've got to move pretty quick because you've got to light each of those shots. What I'll do is rehearse the actors, I'll block it, rehearse with them, and then I'll point the camera one way and shoot everything with the lights that way. Then I'll turn the camera around and shoot everything this way. And I save a huge amount of time if I do that. So I'm not lighting this way and turning around and lighting that way, which is obviously much more time consuming. And uh, um, So there are things you learn that actually speed up the whole process. But everything's in the plan. Are there disagreements often between the directors and the yeah. actors? And how do you deal when such disagreements happen? Yeah. The uh, the the their own Sorry, she'll have to decide that. Are there disagreements between you as the director and the actors? Oh yeah, I mean that happens. Um, you know, they, they, um, you do have... Uh, and the disagreements are uh, often very positive disagreements. Like when you're blocking a scene, you know what that means? That means you, you're telling the actors where to move. So you go across to here, you go across to the sink, then you go to the cu cupboard when the phone rings, you go there, blah, blah. So you, 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 you basically, it's called blocking the scene, right? And then an actor might say, well, you know, it doesn't feel right. Why can't I do this? And et cetera, et cetera. So well, often the, 
arguments will be constructive and you'll come out with the best result. Right? Because actors are, that's what they do. They act and they know what they're... <laughs> you, you, you really let them contribute because you'd be nuts not to. Um, and it's really a question with actors of just um, nudging them this way, nudging them that way, um, just sort of the balance of the performance and so forth. And I always, I always do a lot of research on the characters. Um, the secret really is to know more than anybody else on the floor. Know your script more than anybody else, on the, including the actors. Right? And, uh, and sure, you know, on uh, Casino Royale, I had a couple of arguments with Daniel Craig. Um, where, uh, and, and, and constructive arguments too. You know, really constructive. There was, there was one, I don't know if you'll remember that film, but there's a big action scene in the airport um, where uh, the terrorist has got away in this kind of petrol tank. And Bond gets on and they start uh, just keeping her up. <laughs> there's a petrol tank. And at the end of it, the bad guy, Bond, gets grabbed by security. And the, the villain is sort of watching from a distance. And the question was, um, how, does, how does Daniel beat the guy? How does he get around this? And the point was that as they're approaching towards the end of it, the bad guy has put a detonator on the truck, which is full of which is full of gas, full of petrol, right? Heading towards this plane, and he's got the detonator on the truck. At one point in the fight, Bond gets pushed out, he's kind of hanging off the side of the vehicle, and he sees the detonator. Now when he's, uh, he, Bond kicks the, the bad guy out of the truck, manages to just pull it up before it hits the part of the aircraft, and while he's wrestling by the security police, there's the bad guy over there watching. And the bad guy presses the detonator on the truck. And what Bond has done is, <coughs> in the fight, he's hooked the detonator onto the bad guy's belt. Right? So the bad guy blows up. Right? And we had a big argument about that, because before that, in the way it was written, the bad guy had a gun on Bond, and how was Bond going to like knock the gun out of his hand? Was it was he going to smash the door into him, whatever? And Daniel argued, quite right, that we should use none of that. I mean, you know, he's, he's got to be clever about it. You can't just do what they do in these movies, which is, he's so fast, he knocks the gun out of the hand, or, you know what I mean, all the old, old stuff that you see. And so, between us, we came up with the idea of the dead man. So, that, that's the sort of constructive argument. It's going to work very well. Since we're at it, who do you prefer, James Bond, Daniel Craig or Pierce Brosnan? Do you know, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> well, they're so different. I mean, you know, Brosnan really was a throwback to the old, old one. You know, very good looking, very sort of suave. Um, and really, he was sort of part of the Connery Moore, um, part of that one. When we did. Casino, it was decided that we should do something much grittier, much tougher, and make Bond much more realistic than we had been in the previous Bond movie. So, tonally, we did something completely different. And I, I, I would say that Craig is probably Craig, I think, because he, he brought it into contemporized the whole thing. You know what I mean? I think it's much more 2000, well it was 2006 or 7 we made the movie. And it was much more relevant to them, if you see what I mean, than the, yeah. than the Pierce Brosnan. Mm. Uh, was there any time uh, that like, during a scene where uh, two actors were, maybe more actors were fighting, and they actually got in a fight? A real fight? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe me and the producer. <laughs> uh, that was about it. No, they don't. Not really. No, you, you don't. Uh, you, 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 you don't uh, do that. No, no. 
I've never had that. Um, in times of uh, streaming services, AI and uh, CGI, where is the future of c cinematic movies going, in your opinion? Well, I hope that God stays in the theatres as well, because when I go to the cinema, I always go to IMAX, and it's tremendous. I mean, you, you can't experience that. There's no way you can experience that anywhere other than IMAX, right? So, for me, it's in the theatre. Um, but obviously, streaming is completely... You know, has, um, it has take, uh, changed the whole face of it. And then a lot of movies I just simply go to on to Netflix or whatever it is. You know. um, and now what they're doing is there are a few films that have been made by Netflix where they put them on the big screen and they made a lot of money. And then they take them off and obviously put them on stream. As most films do anyway. Ultimately they end up on streaming because it's a revenue stream. something you really would like to put on a big screen, something you really think, since years, okay, this would be something, a great story I want to put on the screen, everybody to see. Yeah, there are certain stories that you sort of, you know, that you, you, you think, well, I'd love to, you know, be able to put that on the screen and so forth, but sometimes you develop them, you, you develop them and try and get them set up. Excuse me. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, you try and get them set up, if you see what I mean, but it's an uphill struggle, you know, the, the, <laughs> um, I've got a set of books called Quilla, which is a terrific series of books, all set in the 60s and 70s about major, but it was really, really good. Um, you can't put the books down, but a combination of difficulty in getting the rights to the books, plus getting someone to finance it is, is, uh, is very difficult. For years I've tried to get that set up, and so far I haven't succeeded. So, so yeah. Uh, what are you working on right now? What am I working on now? Yeah. Uh, I've just finished a movie called... Um, Dirty Angels. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dirty Angels, yeah. It's about, a, it's about a group of women soldiers who go into Afghanistan now. And 
they go in to rescue eight schoolgirls who have been kidnapped by ISIS. And the reason it's women is because women are treated like fifth-class citizens in, in uh, Afghanistan. And of course they were, you know, they're basically undercover, both literally and figuratively speaking. So, <laughs> so we've, we've, I, I've still got a little bit to film on that. But I'm just off to do a thrill out in London. In fact, I'm going tonight to start the prep work on a movie called Cleaner, which is a thriller. And uh, it's based around a girl who's a, is window cleaning in an ex soldier on the side of the Shard building, the big, big building in London. That is. So a lot of it takes place 700 feet up in the air. So, so I'm, I'm going off tonight to sort of start it. Uh, who's your favorite director? Who's my favorite director? Oh, David Lee. No question. Okay. Is, is Edith Lawrence, Bridge on the River Kwai, Dr. Zhivago. Incredible director. And Sidney Lumet is a director you've probably never heard of, but he was a wonderful director, wonderful actress director, too. So, Since you said your favorite part is the editing afterwards. How come you've never done an animation movie or just something where you just don't have to shoot, it's only editing? So, sorry, sorry, what was that? Because you say you love editing, why haven't you done an animation because you don't need to shoot? I, I'm, animation's not me. So, there are people much better than me to uh, Is that still the same type of thing? I'm sure it's wonderful and, and, uh, and so forth, but uh, there are just people much better. More, much better than I would be. Who have the patience to do that? I don't have the patience to do that. Does an animation movie still have the same type of directing as a live action movie? Is that the same idea? I do. To be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm a little what's the word fuzzy on just how that works. I mean, there's always a director on these movies. On Pixar movies, for example, there's always a director there. I'm a little unsure of the process and how that actually works. <clears throat> Should there be artistic boundaries when it comes to topics and settings like taboos, uh, social taboos you would never put your hands on as a director? Like, this is a topic I don't want to work on or do you say there's a freedom of art. No, I think you're open to anything. I mean, really. And it's whatever interests you. I mean, I always choose my project. First of all, you have to be offered the project. Right? You can develop it yourself. You know, uh, but you have to be offered the project. Most of them are awful. Most of them are. Most of the stuff you get sent is, is crap, basically. Uh, so, but uh, occasionally a good one will turn up. Or certainly one that is potentially good. Which means that if it's a really good idea, it's a good story, but the characters need work, and the, um, uh, you can sit with the writer and then start, you know, as we did with Dirty Angels, you know, the script was crap to start, but it's, uh, it turned into a very good script. You know, we changed writers and uh, went to work, and because it's a good story, different story. Really, you can turn often, providing the structure is good and the is good. Detail. And by the way, Hollywood, um, Hollywood changes writers all the time. You know, a lot of films you'll see they've got five writers who come on off the you know, crazy. And now they are on strike, no? Or at least a couple of weeks ago, they were on strike again? Oh, no, they're still on strike. They're still on strike, yeah. Yeah, nobody's working at all. So there are no scripts anymore at the moment? No, well, the, the WGA, which is the Writers Guild, if you remember the Writers Guild, you can't, you can't write like anything. You're not allowed to. So uh, what that's done is it's suddenly dried up now. So a lot of movies have shut down. A lot of TV shows have shut down. And then a lot of people are not working.